So now we get to talk about starting all over in Indian territory, right? Because that's essentially what reconstruction is about. Reconstruction with the Confederacy and reconstruction in Indian territory is starting all over, except in Indian territory, it is specific to Indian territory. It is completely separate from what's happening in the rest of the United States. When we talk about um, what you understand uh, happening with reconstruction in terms of the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, when you talk about reconstruction as you understand it from the general narrative of U.S. history, what I want you to understand is this is going to be uh, separate. So um, this is going to be one of those situations where um, knowing the narrative of U.S. history doesn't necessarily help you um, in learning Oklahoma history, right? Because this is where the, the narrative goes completely parallel. Uh, it is, it, it's just not going to be something that um, relates to what's actually happening to the rest of the country. Um, when we talk about uh, Reconstruction here, I'm going to remind you what Lincoln says in his second inaugural address, right? In his second inaugural address, he talks about, or he uses the phrase charity for all. That does not apply to Native Americans, right? He specifically talks about um, charity for all, uh, in you know, especially when you consider um, the fact that uh, you had um, members of the Confederacy commit treason, right? They committed treason against the United States by seceding against, uh, seceding from the Union, right? Uh, essentially uh, betraying um, the Constitution of the United States, uh, completely withdrawing from the Union and walking away from it and then trying to, uh, you know, claim their own independence. And then there are these five Southeastern tribes who had their own sovereignty, right? These were five sovereign nations who had their own alliances and were shown no charity whatsoever. So when we talk about reconstruction for these native peoples, these are going to be policies that will not be at all charitable whatsoever. The policies in reconstruction are going to be much more, des much more um, uh, palatable when you compare the two. Um, so we'll start by talking about the Fort Smith Council, uh, which was assembled in September of 1865. Um, and the Fort Smith Council uh, takes place um, in Arkansas, um, and it is attended uh, and led by uh, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, Dennis Cooley, C-O-O-L-E-Y, um, and he is joined by the Superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Southern super, uh, Superintendency, um, Elijah Sells, S-E-L-L-S. Um, uh, so, uh, these two men, Dennis Cooley and Elijah Sells, oh, and also there is a special commissioner, special commissioner, Eli, E-L-Y, Eli Parker. Um, Eli Parker was a member of the Seneca tribe. Uh, Seneca tribe, um, was originally located, uh, in the New York area, Seneca, S-E-N-E-C-A. Uh, he would be a future member. I don't know if I've actually spelled these. Um, there you go. Uh, Eli Parker um, would be a future commissioner of Indian Affairs. So these three men um, are incredibly influential and powerful men. Um, these three men were the ones who would come forward and say uh, that we have to create new treaties um, and uh, have the tribes sign these new treaties. Um, but the federal government will insist that in these new negotiations, they will have um, 
you know, the power. They will have the upper hand and the advantage. Uh, in fact, the reason why they argue that, and this is what you have to, you know, make note of if you haven't uh, done so already in your notes uh, from the Civil War lecture, uh, is that the Confederate alliances that they established during the Civil War eliminated uh, any previous treaty that these Southeastern tribes signed. In fact, not just the removal treaties, but all of the treaties, every single treaty they had ever signed in their history, going back a century, all of those treaties were nullified. They were null and void. Uh, in fact, what they say, uh, what they argue is the na native peoples had quote, rightfully forfeited all of their annuities and their lands. So when, when I say they are starting from square one, that's what I mean. They are starting from scratch. Um, so when we talk about the advantage of the federal government, um, the, the, the federal government is essentially trying to force uh, these this very harsh peace on these tribes. Now, tribal leaders are going to come back and reject, you know, a lot of these initiatives, but, um, you know, when it comes right down to it, the federal government gets to you know, push back quite a bit and, and come back with the advantage. So I want to talk about, um, yeah, we, I want to talk about what these treaties have in mind. So by the time these treaties are actually signed and agreed upon, um, essentially you have new treaties that involve less land. Um, so I want to talk about, um, what these treaties end up looking like, uh, where these treaties are signed and, and how it all comes about. So the, the new meetings are, uh, agreed upon in Washington, DC. Um, when they're finalized, you have the guys from Fort Smith, um, who uh, I mentioned in the previous slide, plus the Secretary of Interior, uh, who is uh, a guy that should sound familiar to you. I referred to in the last lecture a, a guy named James Harlan. James Harlan, in the, lax in the last lecture, James Harlan, H-A-R-L-A-N, was a senator from Iowa who had proposed a bill to end tribal sovereignty and establish um, a, a territorial government to later become a state. That guy, he was now serving as the Secretary of the Interior, and he would, because he was Secretary of the Interior, be present at these meetings to sign uh, or to help uh, negotiate these treaties. That's never a good thing. Um, so let's talk about these, uh, treaties, who signs what, when, and, um, let's go from there. So the Chickasaw and the Choctaw, uh, sign a joint treaty on July 10th of 1866. The Creek and the Cherokee signed their treaties on August 11th, 1866. And the Seminole signed their treaty on August 16th of 1866. Uh, in terms of their agreements, here's what all of the tribes got on their side. Uh, for their benefit, they would receive amnesty for all crimes committed against the United States prior to the treaties, including... Um, they would this would include uh, a specific provision of peace and friendship toward the united states in other words um crimes and uh, crimes committed against the united states meaning uh we forgive you for fighting against the united states during the civil war we forgive you for 
fighting in an uh, joining up in an alliance with the Confederacy against the United States. We forgive you for killing members of um, the United States Army. We forgive you. We forgive you. So those are the crimes that the United States is talking about. That's exactly what these crimes are um, essentially pointing out. What we're talking about here is you will not be punished for your alliance. Furthermore, when we talk about um, this peace and friendship, the treaties are establishing uh, that from this point on, there is a, a relationship of peace and friendship between the United States and the Cherokee tribe, the Creek tribe, the Choctaw and Chickasaw tribes. Um, that's the idea that there is peace and friendship from here on out. We recognize no enmity. Um, we, we aren't even going to remember the fact that you had an alliance with the Confederation, uh, with the Confederacy, we're not even going to think about that. Talk about that. It doesn't even matter anymore. Now, that's it. That's what the tribes get. You will get land, but it's got, not going to be nearly as much as you had before. Uh, you'll, uh, you might get, you'll get some annuities, but it's not going to be nearly as much as you had before. Um, that sort of thing. So when we talk about uh, forgiveness, uh, it's forgiveness, but not the kind of forgiveness, uh, that they had wanted. Because remember the federal government is in control and the federal government has got a lot of power here, right? And that's the card they're going to play. So let's talk about, uh, what the federal government gets out of this and get ready because the federal government gets a lot. So get ready to write. When we talk about what the federal government gets, uh, first of all, the federal government gets the tribes to free the slaves and adopt the slaves into the tribes. In other words, um, the slaves, the freed people become the tribe's problem, not the American government's problem. Now, here's the thing. When we talk about this issue, um, keep in mind the 13th amendment has, uh, freed the 13th amendment has freed the slaves, right? The 13th amendment has already freed the slaves, but technically the 13th amendment freed the slaves that Southerners owned. And the argument here is that well, the tribes are sovereign peoples and as sovereign peoples, the U S government can't necessarily, um, and won't necessarily have to deal with this enslaved population. Um, so they're going to be your problem. Now, when we talk about the enslaved population, um, the enslaved population of the tribes, what the government is doing is saying, okay, you have to free your slaves and then adopt them into your tribal population. And then they become your problem. You figure out what you're going to do with them. They become citizens of your tribe. And then we don't have to worry about them. We being the federal government, we don't have to worry about get granting them citizenship. We don't have to worry about incorporating them into our population. That's what you've got to do. That's, that's the key right there. Now, when we talk about how the tribes respond to that, the Cherokee, the Creek and the Seminole gave, uh, freed people unqualified rights, meaning, um, you have whatever rights that you have. Citizenship is going to be really tricky. Uh, and in fact, uh, up until the last 20 years, um, 
you know, it was, especially for the Cherokee tribe, the whole question of citizenship for freedmen had been a real issue. Um, and so that was, that was a, an issue up for debate, right? For the Choctaw and the Chickasaw, uh, it becomes, um, less of, uh, a debate that, the Choctaw and the Chickasaw gave freedmen the choice of being adopted into their nation or being removed by the federal government and settled elsewhere. So in other words, if you were freedmen, um, you could uh, be adopted into the Choctaw and Chickasaw tribe, be a part of their tribe and incorporated into their people, or you could just um, leave and uh, be your own independent people. Um, so you had a choice with them. The Cherokee Creek and Seminole, um, you had free unqualified rights, uh, live among them and, and you were fine. Citizenship though, uh, was a little bit trickier. Um, okay. The, the next thing that the government, uh, gained from these treaties, um, was that, uh, they would allow railroads into Indian territory. Uh, this is huge. So railroads by the 18, uh, by the mid 1800s are everything. Railroad companies and the federal government are essentially going to have this ongoing partnership, right? Because railroads were going to be the newfound way of, um, connecting the country. It's the partnership of, uh, you know, leading the way for communication, for transportation, um, for uh, allowing the country to essentially uh, make progress into the next century, right? And uh, it was also going to connect the East to the West. Um, but in order for that to happen, you would have to make way across the West. And that was really problematic considering that across the West, particularly through the plains, you have, um, huge native populations and you have a massive Buffalo population. That's a real problem. And so going across Indian territory where you've, you had these, um, huge, you had these treaties that established, um, tribal sovereignty where they controlled all of this land um it was really problematic to allow railroad companies to go through there and uh, take control of the area right so um when we talk about uh allowing railroads into indian territory that's that's pushing native peoples out of the way and allowing American businesses, allowing American corporations in, uh, and giving a, a whole lot of control, right? The other thing that, uh, the government got was allowing federal courts, um, jurisdiction over non-Indians. This is huge. Federal courts gaining jurisdiction over non-Indians implies that non-Indians would have a presence in Indian territory, right? And not only that, when you have non-Indians living in Indian territory and then non-Indians breaking the law, they are not held accountable to Indian judges and Indian tribal law, right? So that's really problematic. Because now you are essentially taking native sovereignty and putting an asterisk by it, right? You've got native sovereignty and you're saying to native sovereignty, while well, we know that you've got your judges and you've got your native law, but ultimately now that we're pushing our way into Indian territory, we're going to allow federal courts in there and we're going to allow federal courts to have power over non-Indians who live there. And so that means that you guys don't have as much power as we have. The other thing that's going to come in and play a role here is that the government is going to say, listen, we're going to need you guys to establish what's known as an intertribal council. Um, 
And I know that some of you are, some of you, if not all of you are probably thinking, well, what's the problem with an intertribal council? Okay. So the intertribal council, let me first explain what they mean by this. The intertribal council would essentially require each tribe to have one representative and with uh, one representative, if there was uh, and for each larger tribe, so if there were larger tribes like the Cherokee um, or the Creek, um, for each 1,000 tribal members, they would send in an additional um, representative, okay? And then the superintendent of Indian Affairs would serve as the council's chief executive. I'm going to say that again. So... Each tribe would have one representative and with um, the larger tribes, uh, for each 1,000 tribal members, they would get an additional representative. So it sounds a lot like Congress, right? Um, and then there would be a chief executive and that chief executive would be the superintendent of Indian Affairs. Now, the reason why you have an intertribal council is essentially um, when you have a federal government who doesn't want to negotiate with each individual tribe or have to deal with each individual tribe over each individual tiny little thing, you can then deal with an intertribal council. And the intertribal council can manage tribal affairs. And then they can manage these things. So you don't, this is just another way, let me put it this way, another way of chipping, at, chipping away at tribal sovereignty right? Uh, it's another way of getting at tribal sovereignty because now if your tribe has an issue or a problem, you've got to take it to intertribal council and deal with it this way, right? Um, then ultimately there's this issue. You've got to sell parts of your land that you own now that you've had since Indian removal, since the 1830s. You've got to sell part of that land to the United States, okay? And what the United States does with it is entirely up to the United States. This is considered um, the penalty or the punishment for having supported the Confederacy. This is what you're gonna get. This is the, this is the price you pay. Right. So, for example, the Cherokee had to give up the neutral lands that they had in southeastern Kansas and the Cherokee Strip. Uh, they had to give up those lands um, and those lands were sold to the highest bidder for no less than a dollar twenty five per acre. Um, and the federal government would also um, actually, you know what, let me go down the list. Uh, so the Cherokee gave up their lands in Southeastern Kansas. And you'll remember, um, John Ross, um, when he and members of the Cherokee tribe had to, uh, were running away. Um, you'll, you'll read this, uh, you'll have read this in, in the chapter, um, in the first chapter of the book, uh, they ran into, uh, parts of Kansas. This is where they ran to, right? This is where they ran away to. Um, that's, that's the part of the land they owned. Uh, and then the, of course there's the Cherokee strip, right? So they had to give that up to the federal government. Um, then there's, uh, the least district, uh, by the Chickasaws and the Choctaws. They gave that up to, uh, the United States. Um, the Creeks gave up lands, um, to the United States. The Seminoles gave up all of their lands. Now, when we talk about the Chickasaws, the Creeks, uh, Chickasaws and the Choctaws, the Creeks and the Seminoles, they got they were able to give their land. But remember, uh, all of their lands, they are all, all of these lands are sold to the United States. 
right? That's the same thing with the Cherokee. They're sold to the uh, to the United States, but for less than it's actually worth. So the Chickasaw and the Choctaw sold the lease district for um, $300,000. The Creeks gave up their land uh, for $975,168. Uh, the Seminole gave up uh, their land for 15 cents an acre. 15 cents an acre. Then they turned around. They gave up all of their land. They turned around and purchased 200,000 acres for 50, five zero, 50 cents an acre from the government. That same land that they had just purchased uh, had been purchased by the government from the creek for 30 cents an acre. If you need to hear that again, pause it and rewind it. But essentially, the government is making so much money. Um, so just so you understand, the Cherokee... Uh, the Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, the Seminole, they're giving up all of this land and they're selling it, but they're selling this land for way less than they could actually make off of it, right? And it's considered punishment for their alliance with the Confederacy. Now, why, what is the United States going to do with all of this land? Well, uh, initially, the United States is holding this land for tribes, uh, for other tribes to move into Indian territory. They're holding it for other tribes. So, for example, the Cherokee um, give up their lands uh, to um, hold it for other tribes, right? Because the federal government is going to sell it to other tribes. Um, the Chickasaw and the Choctaw, same thing. The Creeks give up their lands for four different tribes, the Iowas, the Sac and Foxes, and the Kickapoos. Um, the Seminoles give up their land, uh, same sort of thing, right? Um, so when we look at the map, here's what, uh, here's what it looks like prior to uh, the end of the Civil War. So from 1855 to 1865, this is what it looks like. So I want you to pay attention here because um, when we talk about um, this uh, particular map, I want you to check out how much land we're actually talking about. I mean, this, this amount of uh, land here is no joke. Um, well, hang on. Uh, this amount of land here is no joke. So the Cherokee, for example, have all of this land that, that they control, right. Um, in terms of Northeast Oklahoma and the Cherokee outlet and, uh, in Southeastern, uh, Kansas, which would be right there. Um, that's the Cherokee and all of present day central Oklahoma is for the Creek. Um, the Choctaw and the Chickasaw, of course, uh, have all of this area right here, uh, which is a tremendous amount of uh, land in terms of uh, how much they control. The Seminole, look at uh, how much they have under control. Uh, the other part that uh, I want to remind you of, of course, is the fact that the lease district, which is what uh, the Choctaw and the Chickasaw will give up, right? they end up selling this entire region um, to the government for $300,000, right? Which is way less than it's actually worth. This is what they will sell for $300,000 um, and, and uh, end up, you know, uh, really just... Um, you know, getting way less than, than what they should get. From 1866 to 1889, uh, this is what Indian territory ends up looking like. And you see how much more uh, divided the land becomes as more tribes are brought into this region. So you can see 
um, the Cherokee still remain in uh, the Northeast and they still have some access to uh, this strip of land here, but you've got the Sac and Fox and the Iowa here. Uh, the Seminole have some control uh, in this region. The Chickasaw and the Choctaw still maintain control in this region. Um, but that's essentially it. This is where the, the five tribes are are reduced to right here. And it's all because of their alliance with the Confederacy. All of this other stuff, everything, everything else, all of this region, all of this area right here in this area had to be given up uh, to uh, the government so that the government could decide um, to sell it, uh, either, uh, open it up for white settlement, open it up for, um, uh, new tribes to come in. Um, and then, you know, you have the fact that the civil war itself, uh, will disrupt tribal governments, right? So when we talk about what tribal governments will look like, listen, uh, and I said this in the previous um, lecture, uh, old rivalries are completely, um, have completely returned. They have been revived. The treaty party supported the Confederacy. The Ross party supported the Union. Um, and so, you know, you've got... Um, a new uh, sort of um, frustration that's developed. Um, and so uh, what ends up happening is uh, by the time you have 1867 roll around, um, the Ross party who had uh, just, uh, who are essentially full bloods, um, just get frustrated and uh, got tired of fighting. So eventually they stand with, uh, they they stood in alliance with Stan Wadey and they will elect this man, um, Lewis Downing as chief in, uh, 1867. Uh, the Creeks will, um, establish a new constitution in, uh, 1867, um, which establishes three branches of government. Uh, in terms of how uh, this is different from their previous government, um, they establish a council with two legislative bodies, um, the House of Warriors and the House of Kings. Um, and they also create six judicial districts uh, with a courthouse, a judge, uh, as well as a prosecuting attorney. Um, the Seminoles um, deal with a tremendous amount of factual, factionalism, and as you saw in the previous maps, um, they've got to, you know, move again, and, you know, they're moving uh, east of their old settlements, and so... Uh, when they moved initially, um, you know, you'll notice, uh, they moved uh, onto, they had to move to a smaller piece of land. Uh, that was because when they first moved, um, they were on someone else's land. Um, and so they had to move again, this time to smaller, uh, pieces of land when they dealt with, um, civil war loyalties, uh, they also were dealing with division along religious beliefs. The Seminoles had to, um, uh, the Seminoles were actually dealing with a religious factionalism between, and you're not going to believe this, Presbyterians and Baptists. True story. Um, so what are you going to do? Uh, so, um, this was a very deeply divided tribe. Um, so it wasn't just about, uh, civil war loyalties. It was about denominational loyalties. Um, the Choctaws and the Chickasaws were also dealing with, uh, factionalism. It wasn't nearly as bad as with the Seminoles. Um, but the Choctaws are going to have their own constitution. Um, so they're dealing with divisions as well. Things are, are not going smoothly. Um, in terms of societal issues, uh, their first priority is going to be education. 
Uh, they rebuild their schools um, and mission boards are going to help with that. Mission boards are going to uh, help reopen schools. They're going to reestablish their churches. Tribal newspapers are going to be uh, published again. All of these are done. Education is going to be reestablished, churches rebuilt, um, and and publications are are published again. All of these are done to try and um, recreate some semblance of normalcy and stability. That's what's important here. It's 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 an attempt at trying for normalcy and stability because what's about to happen is uh, a change and a challenge to all of that uh, starting with those blessed railroads when we talk about these railroads this is essentially going to cause the most amount of problems for native peoples in Indian territory. They cause the most disruption, right? Um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a disruption to, um, the economy. It's going to be a disruption to the environment. It's going to be a disruption to how people live. Um, it's going to be a disruption to daily life. Uh, it's going to bring in uh, whole new populations of peoples. Um, nothing is going to be the same with railroads, right? You can't even, um, you know, live around a railroad without being disrupted and disturbed by railroads, right? You you hear them. Um, and it's it's annoying and disturbing. Um, so I want to talk about that. I mean, railroads are, are are going to economically change things and certainly bring about a tremendous amount of economic growth. But again, it dis, it it changes your way of life. It changes your peace of mind. It changes everything. Um, so I want to talk about some of the the main. Uh, railroad lines uh, uh, in Indian Territory. The uh, main one that comes through, the first one that comes through, uh, of course, is the MKT, known as uh, the Katy, uh, that thrives from 1870 to uh, 1873. Uh, the MKT, it stands for Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Line. It connected uh, Texas to Kansas via Cherokee Nation. Um, it was built, excuse me, built uh, from 1870 to 1873. So it brings in all of these men, um, primarily white men, to build the railroad line. Um, and uh, that brings in its own disruption, right? Because you have white men who are coming in to uh, uh, build these railroad lines. And along with that, you are going to have, um, all of these sort of towns that are established, uh, some of them temporary towns, um, to accommodate the railroad lines. Right. Um, and then when you have, um, the, uh, Katie line, uh, it connects, uh, and it's connecting Kansas, uh, to Texas and also a connection into Missouri, um, you also have the fact that you have white populations traveling through Indian territory, which uh, causes a lot of disruption as well. Um, and then you have the east-west lines, right, uh, that are going to connect St. Louis to San Francisco through Cherokee and Creek nations. Um, and so now we're going across Indian territory between 1882 and 1888, 11 railroads will get charter approval from the United States and none of them will have Indian approval because they are not required to have Indian approval. None of them are required to have approval from native nations because that was never a condition in the treaties. That's the kicker. There are, they are not required to have, uh, 
uh, these appro- their, uh, their approval because essentially the agreement was um, you've said that railroads can come through Indian territory. That's all the approval that the federal government needs. So that means that when we talk about um, these railroad companies, native nations had no control over the railroad companies. And when we talk about these railroad companies, railroads brought in their own workers, they built their own towns. This is important for you to remember, so make sure that you're writing this down. Railroads brought in their own workers, built their own towns, and they exploited Indian-owned resources, which uh, also, uh, the other problem with this is that this is going to lead to, um, the breakup of tribal nations. It leads to the increase of, um, non-native migration into Indian territory, right? So you're going to have a lot of non-native peoples moving into Indian territory. And what ends up happening is these railroad companies are going to pave the way for um, the takeover of Indian territory in a huge way, the American takeover of Indian territory. And this is a preview of what's to come for the American West. And this is the thing, when I told you at the very beginning that Uh, Oklahoma history is a microcosm of what takes place in American history. This is a preview of what's taking place in plains, in uh, in the Great Plains, because um, this is exactly what's happening in the eighteen six in the eighteen seventies with the Great Plains, right? you have railroads who are making their way across the West and, uh, doing the exact same thing. And they're going to be killing off Buffalo to make way for the railroads. And we're going to talk about this in another lecture, but it's the same sort of thing. Um, it's going to break up these, t- uh, tribes. It's going to eliminate tribal populations, move forcefully, remove, uh, tribal populations all so that it could make the way clear for American settlement. Um, one of the other things that will happen, um, as a result is it's going to lead to a tremendous amount of lawlessness in Indian territory. And initially it is blamed on freedmen. Um, so, you know, the newly freed, uh, peoples had very few opportunities to begin a new life. Uh, the Chickasaws had been the only tribe of the five. They had been the only tribe actually granting citizenship. Um, for the other four, you had rights, but not citizenship. Um, and what that meant was you could live, um, but you couldn't necessarily have access to things. Um, and so for a lot of these people, stealing was your only means of livelihood. Um, and so, uh, many of these tribes would, create vigilante patrols. There were also, um, especially among non-native populations, they especially would create vigilante patrols because in the territories you didn't have, um, you know, actual state protection because you didn't, you weren't a state, you were just living in a territory. And even then it was Indian territory. Um, so you had vigilante patrols sent out specifically to arrest black people because they were black, not even because they were breaking the law, but because they were black. So if you were, um, black, chances are, even if you weren't breaking the law or doing anything wrong, 
you were going to be arrested if you were just roaming. Um, so what ends up happening is uh, black people um, would start to settle closely to one another because there was safety in numbers. And this was the beginning of all black towns and communities. Um, and in uh, the next lecture, I'll show you a map of where these black towns and communities um, would be uh, were created and, and how, how many there are. So you, you will see a map. I'll show you a map of, of where they are, uh, where they would be located, but there were safety in these black towns and black communities. And let me just add to that, not only safety, but also success, um, economic success, political success, um, and, um, actually sovereignty there, black sovereignty in these black towns and communities. Um, the lawlessness, a tremendous amount of lawlessness would come from white outlaw bands. Um, so you, this is where robber's roost would gain its, um, you know, reputation. Uh, so, uh, out by, uh, the pan, what we now know as the Oklahoma panhandle, uh, and other areas around it, uh, you have robber's roost. And essentially it's this region, uh, or this area where you would have known criminals hang out, um, and hide from the law. And the thing of it is, is, uh, because it was this abandoned region where no one would really go and patrol because no one really had any control in the area. And it was be uh, because it was Indian territory. Um, no one would really care. Um, and then what would make it worse were the railroads. Uh, the railroads actually brought in prostitutes. Um, remember I told you that with um, the construction of railroads and that sort of thing, you uh, had the, these, temporary towns and that sort of stuff. So you would have the building or construction of saloons. And with the saloons, you would have prostitutes, you would have alcohol, you would have gambling and you would have, you know, thieves. Um, and there was no real regulation of those, uh, of such things. And so native peoples, um, these different tribes, actually started reaching out to the federal government asking for help. Um, and the person uh, that the federal government actually sent in for help um, was a judge named uh, Isaac Parker. So Isaac Parker is um, the this person right here. So this, uh, this judge right here. Um, so Isaac Parker, um, was, uh, in, in 1864, Isaac Parker had actually, um, run for uh, County prosecutor of the ninth Missouri judicial court, uh, district. And in the fall of the same year, um, had served as, uh, you know, a member of the electoral college. He had voted for, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and then, um, so he's, uh, you know, someone who is familiar with the region because he's from, um, Missouri. He ends up serving in Congress, uh, in the early 1870, uh, 1870s. Um, then in 1872, um, you know, or in 1874, excuse me, um, he had, uh, you know, sought out, um, a presidential appointment, um, to become a judge, uh, for the Western district of Arkansas, uh, specifically in Fort Smith. Um, and so he, uh, was appointed to the bench in March of 1875. Um, in, uh, uh, for uh, the Western district of Arkansas. So he's appointed by none other than Ulysses S. Grant. And, um, this is really important too, because, uh, Parker had by that point, you know, had been someone who, uh, had, 
known the law, understood the law, uh, specifically of the American West, right? Um, uh, so, you know, as a guy who is from Missouri, um, and then going into Arkansas, he's, he's not stupid, right? He knows the law. Um, and by that point he's experienced with the federal law at that. So over the course of, um, you know, 21 years, he will, uh, rule over 9,000 cases. Um, and he will gain the reputation of being the law west of Fort Smith. Um, he's a tough, he's a very tough act. Um, so he becomes um, the judge at 36. And at the age of 36, he's the youngest man to ever become, or he's the youngest judge uh, in the West. Um, and so, uh, when he becomes judge, um, his first case, just to give you kind of an example of the kind of judge he is, his very first case is in May of 1875. Um, there were eight men who show up, uh, and these eight men were accused of murder. All eight men were found guilty and all eight of them were sentenced to death. This man, this guy does not play. Um, he holds court, uh, he held court six days a week. Um, and it's like for 10 hours a day. Um, and the reason why he is this, um, vigorous about it is because at, you know, the, or the reason why he's this intense about it is because it's that bad. Um, things have gotten that out of control. So when native people ask for help, uh, it's not because they think it's, it's not because that, um, they're complaining that there are too many white people or anything like that. It's because it really is that bad. Um, I, I believe I mistakenly said, um, 9,000 cases in 21 years, there were actually, uh, um, there were 9,000 cases that resulted in convictions. Uh, he heard, uh, over 13,000 cases, um, 9,000 of them, uh, were actually convictions. Um, when we talk about, uh, how important it was that you had a guy, um, like Isaac Parker, um, the other thing that uh, I've got to emphasize here is the presence of uh, Bass Reeves. So Bass Reeves is important um, because of, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. So Bass Reeves, uh, you see pictured here, is uh, is a black uh, a black man. So Bass Reeves has this um, really fascinating a uh, personal story. He was born as a slave in Arkansas and, um, then, uh, escaped, um, into the North, um, uh, into Indian, Indian territory. Um, and that's where, uh, you know, when, while he was in Indian territory, he became, uh, acquainted with, um, the different tribes he became acquainted with, uh, actually the, the Cherokee, the Seminole, uh, and with the Creek. Um, so, um, you know, while he lived in Indian territory, um, he, um, was there for a time period during the war. And then after the war, uh, he settled down, uh, in Arkansas. Um, and then, um, while he uh, settled down in Arkansas, he worked as a farmer. And then on occasion, uh, he worked for uh, 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 for uh, deputy U.S. marshals um, who were based out of Fort Smith. Um, and what's interesting is that um, there was a need, um, you know, 
for them to go into Indian territory. Um, and he, you know, because of his time in Indian territory, uh, he helped them out uh, going into uh, Indian territory. He made a lot of money helping them out. Uh, he and he had the skills for it. And so um, after Isaac Parker uh, became a judge in Fort Smith, uh, Parker actually commissioned Reeves as a deputy U.S. marshal. Um, and Reeves is actually uh, supposedly um, one of the earliest uh, Black Americans uh, to become a deputy U.S. marshal, um, at least west of uh, the Mississippi River. Um, and that was his job for the next 32 years, is working as a deputy marshal in Indian Territory. Um, he was the only uh, deputy to uh, begin with Parker's Court and work there until Oklahoma statehood. Um, and then, uh, you know, here's a guy who um, uh, he was uh, someone who was actually um, was well respected and had earned that respect. And that's the same thing that was said for Parker. You don't mess around with these two men. Now, here's the problem. When we talk about Parker, and even when we talk about Reeves, uh, the challenge here for Native peoples is this. Uh, in accepting Parker's authority and in accepting Reeves' authority, it was yet another compromise in tribal sovereignty, right? It was yet another loss in tribal sovereignty in that they had to ask for American help in managing the, the crime and the, and the, you know, the outlaws in and around their own tribal nations. They could not manage it and they didn't have the authority to manage it. They didn't have the, the power at all. And this is a part of the price that they paid uh, for their allegiance to the Confederacy. And this is the price they paid with those reconstruction treaties.